let's see. Let me describe to you a little bit about Nepal. 52% um, of males are illiterate, 24% of females are illiterate. The gender gap is even uh, as small as in Kathmandu, which is the capital, which implies that it's greatest out in the rural villages where we do our work. Um, in urban areas, 85% of males, 79% of females attend school. However, uh, girls in rural areas have significantly lower school attendance, 54%. Um, in 2009, that's the latest stats I can find because they don't do census bureaus uh, work there. Uh, literacy rates were uh, right around 59%. And I also have to say that um, a few years ago, I believe roughly two years ago, um, they had this, the, a major national event. Um, the Maoists were trying to overthrow throw the king of Nepal. They still had a king as of two years ago. And out of this 10-year civil war came their first democratic government. And um, they're still currently trying to write their first uh, constitution. So to give you a little bit of historical perspective, it's a developing country that is still struggling. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so we actually use voice thread. And uh, I was actually pretty inspired by Blood's presentation at ISTE last year. And, uh, um, that's where it all started, actually. Uh, we, we, you met the um, voice for a guy. So the like, voice for yeah, Steve awesome. and those guys were there, and uh, I caught him outside of your conference. Right. And I just walked up to him and I said, you mind if I try your software in the Himalayas in Nepal? And the guy kind of scratched his head and looked at me and he says, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm doing some projects in probably the ruralest of rural areas in the world, and if I can get your product to work here, I think it can work anywhere in the world. Right? Mm -hmm. So they uh, allowed us to jump on board, and uh, we had direct access to their programming team. And uh, this is right around the time when they were writing their iPad app. So we gave them a lot of feedback. Um, and one of them was, in rural areas um, where internet connectivity is rather low, there needs to be a way to capture the voices offline and to allow them to sync with the rest of the world once it gets online. So that's one of the features they added to their iPad app, and we're pretty uh, ecstatic because we um, were given the uh, the beta test version of it when we did our work last summer. We actually cool. tested it out and gave them some feedback. So if you don't know VoiceThread, it's like a threaded discussion through voice, and rather than reading this whole thing to you, I'll just kind of quickly show you a sample. Um, so this is um, what it essentially looks like. Um, and I'll talk over the voice here, but you can kind of see what's going on. So here's an elementary school student who drew a picture and wrote a poem. And all of these people from around the world. On the sign up on the wall there? No, no, it's on the. Um, it's on that and all of these people around the world are chiming in via voice. I love the way it turned out. <laughs> I really love your haiku poem about snow. I grew up in a town where we had lots and lots of snow and, and ice skating and flooding. And your poem really reminds me of what it was like when I was younger. So thank you so much and keep up the good work. OK. So. Um, why did we feel this was a, a perfect tool to use in Nepal? Because of the, one of the previous slides, the literacy rate. Okay? And uh, I teach in the teacher ed department at Azusa Pacific. I teach elementary school teachers. And we, we talk about like you know methods or theories with second language learners and things like that. right? And a lot of the, the textbooks I use um, focus um, literacy on reading and writing. Okay? But there are other forms of literacy. Literacy in forms of listening and speaking, okay, ones that are not as formally tested in our world, but prevalent here. So the 53% that are illiterate, well, guess what? They can speak and listen in their native language, but it's not measured, okay? So the reason it's a perfect tool is because we can put um, content up here and allow your low literate to non literate people to actively engage with the content. It only makes sense. Okay, um, 
And uh, this is the model that we use in, in our teacher ed department to measure how well a technology integration really is, the TPAP model, some of you might have seen it before. So essentially, how does technology um, enhance pedagogy and content? And I would argue that using VoiceThread in Nepal with um, learning content, um, the VoiceThread itself definitely enhances the pedagogy and the content of what we're teaching. Okay? All right. So uh, Marie's going to show you a little bit about um, what the uh, kids did in Nepal. This is a sample. Um, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one of the ways that we started to begin to introduce this technology when we met with the youth is we talked to them about what was important in their community, what were some topics that needed to be discussed, and so we asked them to go and find an image. And so this is an image of um, someone smoking hashish, which is like very big. I don't know why you think this one can be talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a problem within their, within their villages and within their community. And so that was really good because it was a good starter. It definitely got them engaged in helping to learn how to use this technology here. So when I played the sample, you'll see um, a few of the students speaking in English. Um, English is uh, taught at these schools there in formal schooling, but later on you'll see some uh, of the kids talking in their native language in Nepali, which for me is, is really exciting, the fact they can speak their native language and not have to read and write, which is essentially what this whole project is about. I think this was the day where we were having issues using the voice, and so you can also, using VoiceThread, use text as well. Which that was like, for us to be excited about. Like, never heard your voice before. So that was interesting. This is also one type of drugs. Once we consume, our body demands the weight. When we consume, it affects our body seriously. Ultimately, it fills our brain and then normal. So, as this is powerful poison, so do we want to poison? Okay, so here are some of the uh, results of uh, the workshop that we did. Um, the kids came from 10 telecenters throughout Nepal. So a telecenter is a, a computer center in a rural village, typically like one or two computers, maybe a printer maybe dial-up internet, okay, and uh, the, the communities will literally trek in, hike in, um, upwards of two, three, four hours in one direction to access the internet, guess what, not knowing if there's going to be, okay, connectivity is extremely low. But the fact that they can have the opportunity to do that, a rural village will send a kid to walk that far to see if prop prices have gone up or down, to see if they can this is a daily thing that they do. We'll send somebody to, to the telecenter. Okay, so we brought together um, 10 telecenters, two leaders from each center into this conference, and they created 16 voice threads uh, in July 2011. Um, let's see. They uh, were youth. <laughs> this is interesting. Youth in Nepal are considered anybody that's unmarried between the ages of 16 to 26, so we can all feel a little bit younger today. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, we made sure that there were equal amounts of male and female participants. Um, the leaders had uh, some technical skills, meaning they can navigate uh, their way around the computer. Um, but the topics of the voices were generated by the students, and uh, many of them uh, spoke in their local dialects. Okay, so um, of the topics they um, created, the hashish one had the most views and the most comments using computers, um, waste in the Everest region. You can kind of see where the rest of it falls in. Um, and I have to 
I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit, but the comments seem kind of low, and I think I'll kick in a little bit of Wagner theory and explain why that is a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So LPP, <laughs> legitimate for field presentation. The fact they don't have the internet, okay, doesn't imply that there isn't learning happening. Okay. So a lot of the, the discussions came out of a project that Pro Literacy has been doing in Nepal, in the rural villages for the last 30 years. They would trek in manuals, okay, and these manuals focused on, focused on things like health, um, health and safety, sanitation, HIV awareness, and they would literally go in there and do these workshops and hike out. Where the voice thread um, picks up where they left is it allows them to continue that dialogue and also do some cross-village collaboration, okay? So a village will put a voice set up, and other villages around Nepal will chime in on their uh, discussions. The numbers seem low because they're lurkers, okay? And the feedback that we're getting from the field is that, obviously, there's no electricity. Um, sometimes, in worse of places, 11 hours of blackout. Once there's electricity, you don't even know if they can get online, okay? Um, regardless of the telecenter uh, in Lollipur, uh, they haven't posted a lot because internet connectivity is low, okay? And then um, so there's some technical issues here. They're not able to log in and see their posts. But they, these are some of the reasons why, obstacles, I should say, why is it it's not being used as much. But on the flip side, okay, they're still talking about them in their villages. The fact that Ashish's is one slide with 13 views and 11 comments or whatever, it's a still a viable topic that is constantly being talked about. Um, what, what the youth told us was um, we have to look beyond today. Okay? The fact there's little electricity or internet, but the rest of the world is doing this, we have to be on board so that when electricity comes, when internet comes, we're in a position to implement a lot of these things. Um, in fact, one of the villages we visited last summer, and I've been going there since 2004, um, we pulled up at the village, the whole village came out running and said, we're so happy, it's 200 yards away, 200 meters away. Yeah, and I, for electricity to get to their village. And I said, what are you talking about? Electricity is only 200 meters away today, so every couple of years, it gets a little bit closer, a little bit closer, <laughs> it's 200 meters away. Okay, so they're, they want to project out and be in a position to implement, which is why um, these, these uh, conferences that we've been doing there, these workshops, is so important to them. Uh, conclusion, uh, 69 views, 52 comments, do not account to pay for face-to-face -face discussions. Uh, the themes that emerge from the data, um, three, three of them were focused on computers, four on nature, conflict resolution, and health. Okay? And if you're familiar with uh, Mimi Ito's work uh, on geeking out, okay, um, I, it's interesting that participants in the digital age means uh, more than just being able to access serious online information and culture, but it also means the ability to participate in social and recreational activities online. And this parallels a lot of the feedback that we've got. Yeah. Okay, so our next steps. Uh, there's a need for a longitudinal study to see the implementation of voice thread, to see how it's going over time. Uh, there's a need for a comparative study to, to try something like this in another developing country. And then in terms of Nepal, there needs to be better technology infrastructure, better technical training, uh, gender equity and access to technology for girls. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background on that. A lot of the telecenters that we support, um, a lot of times when we write grants to buy new computers, okay, we actually have to put into the grant, here's the technology center, we're writing a grant for five computers and one sewing machine. <laughs> okay, and from our perspective, what the heck, why a sewing machine, right? Um, if there's a sewing machine at the telecenter, okay, the fathers will allow the daughters to go learn how to sew, which is an income generating skill, and in return, they can learn computers. Okay? If not, then they're not allowed to go. Um, additionally, um, those that are allowed to go have parents who value education, value technology, and they oftentimes will 
carve out time away from doing like chores and things like that, right, to allow the girls to go. But that, those are pretty rare. Um, we asked the girls um, what what their parents would say, what their fathers would say if they asked them, can I go, can you go and learn technology at the telecenter? And one common theme that came up was a, a slogan, um, and it goes like this. They said to me, um, our fathers will tell us, why eat green cucumbers at a time of dying? Say again? Why eat green cucumbers at the time of dying? What do you suppose that means? So green cucumbers are like a luxury, right? It's 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 the most delicacy, you right. know, fresh green cucumbers. So for a girl to eat a fresh green cucumber, it's like a luxury. Why go and learn such a luxury when all at the end of the day you're just a girl? At the time of dying, you'll never do anything with it. Okay, so these are the, the cultural challenges that we're facing. with. Have you ever considered, I mean, this is just brainstorm here, you know, the sewing with the girls do and incorporating that into the voice line? Like, yeah. 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 I mean, they've, they've created, since we did this study, you see a lot of voice threads about that. And also, what Jeff hasn't mentioned with these telecenters, the work that they do, um, they help a lot with their community as far as, like, um, fundraising for sewing machines or they send someone out to learn a different type of sewing technique and then they can bring that knowledge back to their village. So it's kind of like a, do they do like heave alone type of things mm -hmm. there in, the, in that community. And in fact, um, we're big fans of Wenger. I think most of us are, right? Yeah. Right? Community yeah. is a practice, right? So Paul actually went with me a couple of summers ago and he got involved with some of this work. And he uh, started a women's sewing center in a rural village. And, but he was adamant. He says, the only way I'll sponsor something like this is if there's informal learning going on in the community of practice. Okay, so we just wrote up a, a, a summary of our, our research on the informal learning, which, which um, abrasively contrasts how they learn in the fall, which is very formal, top-down, male-dominant. Here we are, female learning. Sewing informal in a community practice, and a lot, a lot has happened more than they would have ever expected, more than we would have ever expected. That's a whole different presentation. Okay, questions? Yeah, you've been able to kind of merge this project with your undergrads. Um, in, in, in short, yeah, but it, yeah, except <laughs> in, in short, um, I run into the same obstacle that Bill was describing earlier, and I don't mean to talk so negatively about universities, mm -hmm. um, but taking students to a developing country is just so challenging, it's not near impossible, especially a conflict their zone country. So um, we have had interns come with us in the past, but it's all done through our nonprofit, as opposed through Jeff, the APU faculty member. So yeah, <laughs> they, they just won't let it happen. So it's a little afternoon. We don't want to keep you too long, but we want you to come back. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Um, that was totally cool.